Hi everyone and welcome to episode 77, installment number two of Brew Talk with Mr. Beer's Advanced Education Series. I am your host Ashley and today we're going to be discussing some very important flavor factors in beer, which are esters and phenols. So what are they and what do they contribute? You may or may not have heard these two terms before, but if you've brewed for some time or you even just enjoy beer, you've probably at least heard them in passing um, a time or two and you've most definitely experienced them probably more than once. Let's start with esters first, um, since this is, they're two different things. So what are they? Esters are fruity tasting compounds. Um, think of flavors that you experience when you drink certain beers that resemble maybe banana, apple, or anything fruit-like that isn't caused by the direct addition of fruit itself. So how are esters formed? Esters in beer are formed by the reactions of organic acids and alcohols created during fermentation. This reaction causes the esterification of these alcohols, including and the most abundantly created ethanol, as well as many higher uh, fusel alcohols and higher alcohols um, in general. So the type of ester that ultimately ends up being formed is dependent on the specific type of alcohol that is being implicated in the esterification. So the most abundantly concentrated esters that we generally uh, talk about in beer are known as acetates, meaning that they use an acetic acid molecule known as acetyl coenzyme A as part of their esterification process and others um, do not use the same chemical acetyl coenzyme A as a catalyst, but they will use others instead. The most significant esters found in beer are isomal acetate resembling banana or pear drop, ethyl acetate, which is like light fruity or solvent like, ethyl caprolate, giving an apple like character ethyl caporate, which is apple-like with a little anise seed, and phenyl ethyl acetate, which resembles roses or honey. Let us take ethyl acetate for example. This ester is caused by the combination of ethanol and acetic acid. Because ethanol is the most abundant alcohol created by the brewing process, the solvent-like presence of ethyl acetate is often detected in beer, especially in beer that is young or green, and you've probably experienced that before. This is because the yeast has not entered the stationary phase and begun to kind of clean up that off flavor, or that ester, depending on its concentrations. Um, at lower concentrations, this ester can translate pleasantly, kind of as like a bright pear flavor, um, but at higher concentrations, when that balance starts to tip, um, it can have a, a very strong kind of solvent or acetone flavor, which um, tends to be unpleasant to say the least. Uh, keeping that particular ester in check because it is it does such have a, a high occurrence is probably one of the more important things um, to most brewers, both professional and home brewer. Um, so they place a lot of emphasis on control parameters. Uh, for example, um, temperature is a big one, of course, and then suitably high pitch rates, which is also very important. In addition to um, being produced by brewer's yeast strains, Saccharomyces um, cerevisiae and Saccharomyces pastorianus, ethyl acetate is also produced in large quantities by wild yeast like Bretomyces, Hanasula, and uh, Picchia via uh, aerobic fermentation. Isomal acetate, another common ester found in and associated with beers that carries a distinctive banana-like flavor and aroma typically found in German um, beers such as Hefeweizen. Isomal acetate is created by the esterification of isom isoamyl alcohol, which is a fusel alcohol, so one of the higher alcohols, 
and its distinctive flavor and effect is a signature characteristic of several German styles, not just the Hefeweizen. Because of the desirability of this ester, <clears throat> brewers will intentionally sometimes create conditions in which to exaggerate its production. If high levels of isomal acetate are what you desire in your brew, the first step, of course, is to select the appropriate yeast. Um, well suited to produce those precursors um, and catalysts that create those uh, ester flavors. Uh, we'll cover that more in depth a little bit later in the discussion as well. So isomal acetate, if you've ever tasted it, you're aware that it's a, a pretty aggressive ester. Um, it's detectable in quantities as low as two parts per million, which is uh, extremely low, um, but it's still enough to reach the flavor threshold on the human palate. Um, so it is one of those esters that when, it's, when you see it, you know it, you know it's there, it's pretty unmistakable. Um, this ester is usually not particularly difficult to control as long as you're selecting a yeast that's not prone to creating it. Um, so if you're, if you're looking for something that's really clean, then you're going to want to make sure that you produce or you pick a yeast that does not produce the catalyst for that ester. So that's very important. Ethyl caprolate, uh, the next common ester on our list, though it is not as abundant as the previous esters we have discussed. So this one is a little bit different in that instead of using acetic acid, this ester is formed by the combination of caprylic acid and ethanol. Caprylic acid is a medium chain fatty acid with a generally unpleasant smell. The corresponding ester, while generally less unpleasant and less offensive, is still usually considered an off flavor, um, especially in, in excessive quantities. Ethyl uh, caprolate comes across as like kind of cloying fruit or brandy-like. Um, at high concentrations, ethyl caprolate can contribute to what you usually hear described as a, a yeasty flavor. Um, and in this ester, when it's controlled and well-placed, it can sometimes be a positive contribution in very specific styles. It just sort of depends. Like ethyl caprolate is ethyl caporate, also known as ethyl hexanate. So those two are interchangeable, uh, depending on what school of thought you're from. This ester is created through the condensation of hexonic acid and ethanol. Ethyl caporate is a pineapple aroma that is lightly flanked by uh, an anise or sometimes almost like a red apple um, character that can be pleasant when appearing appropriately, again, in certain styles. Um, this, the apple flavor that this particular ester carries is different than the apple flavor associated with certain compounds like aldehydes. Um, that translate more as like a sharp green apple. Uh, that is as long, of course, as it stays within those normal uh, ranges. A fun fact about um, this particular acid is that it is one of three fatty acids named in relation to capra, the genus of goats. Um, the name is actually derived uh, because high amounts of that acid are actually what's found in goat's milk and part of what gives it its kind of distinctive aroma and smell. Um, hexonic acid itself can be very unpleasant in high quantities. Typically, generally considered a negative attribute in those cases. Um, the exception is lambics and wild fermentation styles. The Tolerance for those types of acids is much higher in those styles, whereas in more traditional um, styles, it would be considered definitely an off flavor. So the final ester that we will discuss today is phenyl ethyl acetate. Phenyl ethyl acetate is the ester resulting from the condensation of acetic acid and phenyl ethyl alcohol. This ester typically has an aroma that is like roses or honey and is often described as tasting like even raspberry or guava. In most cases, it is minimally present. 
If you decide you want a higher concentration of esters in your beer, or a lower for that matter, you must first start with your yeast selection, as we briefly mentioned earlier. All yeast has individual ester production characteristics. Some yeast will produce more esters than others, and some will produce different esters. Esterification of alcohol is controlled specifically by an enzyme called alcohol acetate transferase, or ATT, or excuse me, AAT for short. So the first way you can increase your beer's fruity flavors and aromas is to select a yeast strain um, with a higher concentration of that AAT catalyzing enzyme. As we learned in our prior episodes, enzymes are the catalyst for literally everything. <laughs> Another common way to increase ester production in fermentation is to under pitch yeast. This creates some stress and stimulates yeast growth which leads to higher ester production. Another method, the one I typically prefer to use, is temperature modulation. Having a slightly warmer fermentation temp can also promote esters and yeast that have the potential to make them. And remember, that potential is very important. Under pitching, in my, my opinion, and the opinion of many other brewers, um, is too risky. I think we all know, just basically in general, how I feel about under pitching. <laughs> and lastly, some individuals choose to promote ester production by under aerating. And this is one that I really just definitely don't recommend, but some brewers do go to it. Um, this can come with the risk of potentially producing extra aldehydes. Um, so I tend to advise people ferment warmer don't under aerate, don't under pitch, um, and select the right yeast. So believe it or not, there's a, a lot of character or a lot of things that can have um, an effect on ester production, even down to the shape of your fermenter. This is why certain breweries, if you take a brewery tour or you look into their brew house, uh, if they have specific specialties, you may see fermentation tanks. Um, of different sizes and shapes, and that's part of the reason for that is ester production. So that, now that we know how to increase our ester production, what about controlling them or even decreasing them? I could basically sum up the explanation for that by telling you to just do the opposite of everything that I just said. Um, and that would, that would pretty much cover it. If you want to reduce the incidence of esters in your beer, in other words, you are looking for a cleaner flavor, uh, there are a few key points to consider and it all comes back to yeast management. And for more on that, you can look at our previous Brew Talk with Mr. Beer video where I go into yeast health and yeast management quite a bit. So there are some things that you're going to want to definitely consider if you're wanting to reduce ester production. So one of those is you want to make sure you adequately aerate. You want to make sure that you select a strain with low ester formation potential. You want to pitch a large number of viable and vital yeast cells and pitch and ferment within the manufacturer's ideal temperature fermentation ranges. Well, that about wraps us up on esters, guys. I hope you enjoyed this and please join me next week for part two where we will discuss the second part of this lecture, which is going to be on phenols. Have a great day, everyone, and cheers.